Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me out here, Mayo Clinic. Um, I feel a little bit of fish out of water because I am a filmmaker. I don't necessarily see myself as a healthcare innovator, but I think this film has uh, taken me and our team on really a remarkable journey and has, in, a, in, a, in a large way, transformed myself as a storyteller, the way I think about storytelling uh, because of the time that I spent in the waiting room at, at Highland Hospital. I just want to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the genesis of the project, but before I do that, I want to give a little shout out to one of the people that was really the, the instrumental in getting this project off the ground, which is uh, my partner, Bill Hirsch, who's a producer and an original funder of the project. Bill, where are you? Raise your hand. There he is. Clap for him, even if you can't see him. He's somewhere out there. There he is. There's Bill. There's Bill. So it, it was funny. I, I came out of uh, film school in, in 99. I went to UC Berkeley, and my wife got her, uh, was coming out of graduate school at the same time. She had her master's in speech pathology, and her first job was at Highland Hospital. And, and so she would come home with these stories about her patients, and immediately the antenna went up for me as a storyteller, and I started thinking, wow, this would be an amazing place to to make a film, you know, a county hospital where patients were, you know, getting up every day with less than, trying to get, get through their day. And um, I really wanted to make this film, but I didn't know how to approach the hospital, you know, how do you work through all the levels of bureaucratic red tape to get a story like this told, and so I never, you know, really did anything about it. And years, years went by, had a couple of kids, you know, get, got my career going, and uh, we moved to New York. I worked for ABC for a few years, and we came back to uh, the Bay Area where we decided we wanted to raise our kids. And Vonna took her job back at Highland Hospital, and she wasn't back a few weeks when she came home and said, guess what? They're making a film about Highland. And I thought, oh, man, I missed my chance. I missed my chance. And she said, guess what? And I said, what? And she said, Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman are, are making the film. And I, I know Rob and Jeff just from my travels in the Bay Area film, film community. Who, who here has seen Times of Harvey Milk or Common Threads, which is the great uh, film about the AIDS quilt? So um, I approached Rob and Jeff and asked if they needed any help on the film, and they, and they did. And the film had uh, been, um, the, the genesis of it was Bill uh, and Scott wanted to make a film at this moment in time when we had many questions about our healthcare system and access to the healthcare system that the uninsured weren't, weren't really having a voice in that conversation and that we needed a film, we needed to tell a story that, that brought their voices to the, to the center of that um, conversation. At a moment when this debate was really being dominated by media pundits and politicians and, and lobbyists, the people who were sitting in these waiting rooms around the country weren't really being heard. And so Bill and Scott approached Rob and Jeff I came on, on board the project, and for a variety of complicated reasons, Rob and Jeff had to go off and make another film, and I took over the film. And I'd also, because documentary filmmakers tend to be, uh, have far fewer zeros uh, on their paychecks than, than some media makers, I, I had to do um, consulting work to, to help pay, pay the mortgage, and I had worked at a couple of startups, and I was watching that the way, we change, the way that we create media and the way that we share media was going under a transformational change at that moment. And I got to thinking that, what if we didn't just make a film, what if we created a community engagement project that brought the voices um, of the people in these waiting rooms into this conversation in a way that could be, could be scaled out? And so when I approached Bill and Rob and Jeff in the hospital and told them I wanted to take over the project, I had this idea in my head that we wanted to uh, engage the, the community of this hospital in a way that would have a deeper impact than, than just a film could make. And so with a little bit of funding from Bill and from some other foundations, we got going and we just started, and this is before we, we even really began rolling on the film, we just wanted to go to the hospital and sit down with the patients in the waiting room and get a sense of their experience in their story. And so I'm about to show you a clip that was um, one of the very first videos that, that we recorded. So why don't we go ahead and roll the first clip. Come here. I see on the mic. No one says go. Here, hold this. Go. With the job market nowadays as it is, 
uh, I was having a hard time finding employment and we lost our home and our vehicle and ended up having to get on a bus and come out to where I have family, which is my mom and my dad and my sister who live out here in the Bay Area. Time to race again. Come on, Andrew. Um, we're waiting for my wife to be able to get signed up on the program. She's been, out, been without insulin since yesterday and we went to a local hospital in the town we live in and basically what they did was they wrote her a prescription and we explained to them that we cannot afford to have, you know, to, to pay for it. Um, we've been on the, at the resource center at 8 o'clock this morning and we're still trying to get insulin at this point and it's probably close to 5 o'clock now. It's hard. It's harder than I ever imagined it would ever be. And all the appointments that you have to go to and how long you have to take and how many people are actually worse off than that. I never even took it into consideration because I always, you know, when you always got something, you never look at the bad side of it. You know, what gives you hope? <coughs> My mom. <coughs> the Lord. But my mom mostly. We were almost we were almost sleeping in a car before. Without her, we wouldn't be nowhere at all. You know, there's a lot of people that are worse off than we are right now. You know, they don't have families. And, you know what I mean? Those are the people that we need to care about too, right? Because we got a lot of people caring about us, don't we? If we didn't, we wouldn't be where we're at. So, so that, that was one of the very first videos that we shot, and that really, I think, got me thinking of the power not just of these stories that we could tell, but of the need for this entire community to share that at this moment when we made this video, this debate was raging around the country and it, it, it was really raging in a way that didn't, that, that sort of took away the focus that we thought we needed to keep, which was who are these people that we're talking about and what are they going through on a daily basis? And then we started thinking, what if you could scale that out? And at this moment in time when we have so many questions about the direction that our healthcare system is, is taking in this country, what if you could bring these um, patient stories into that conversation in a meaningful and actionable way using technology? And at this point, we had no idea what, how we would do this, what, what's the best method of doing that was, how do we use technology? But we did know that we wanted to simply collect their stories. And this was before we, this was an odd process. As a filmmaker, typically you, you write grants to, to make your film, you, you raise the money, you go make the film, the film gets out there, make, hopefully it wins some awards, gets some attention, and then it goes away. What we wanted to do with this project is use these engagements, this time that we could spend with the patients in the waiting room to collect content, but also inform ourselves as storytellers what kind of film needed to be and should be made at, at this time. And so all of these um, videos that we collected became part of the research for us as filmmakers to determine how could we make a film that would be as impactful as we wanted it to be. And so if we can bring up the um, website, if this will work, I can kind of show you how we began to organize. Uh, and this had a redesign, but initially it was just a storytelling project. And uh, if you click on the storytelling project there, you'll see that we have, have all, all these videos. And what we decided to do, um, because it was such an emotional experience sitting down with these patients and giving them the opportunity to share, and because so many of these moments had a poignancy and an emotional resonance to them, we decided to organize them not just by issue, uh, but by, by emotion. And um, so you could click on, click on that, and you see we have different emotions, courage, and and uh, was one of the first ones, and faith, and fear. And one of the things that I think we all realized as storytellers was that this act of simply engaging 
the patients in a way to say, you know what, someone's listening to you, someone cares about what your experience is, without framing it in the context of healthcare reform. We never asked, what do you think about Obamacare? What do you think about healthcare reform? We simply asked, what are you waiting for? And that kind of became almost a tagline for the project. And just that simple question gave birth to a whole host of profound insights and, and stories from this community. And we, we realized they hadn't had a framework for sharing in this kind of way. And so on, on, on many days, we had people lined up wanting to, wanting to tell their story. Well, one of the side effects of this was that it drew a lot of attention to our project, and we were able to quickly raise money to go and make our feature documentary, which was what Bill's initial intent was, was to make a film that would have an impact, a big impact on the national conversation around healthcare reform. And this was in, uh, you know, we began in 2007 before the 2008 election, before the Affordable Care Act was ever passed, to try to get at what was the experience of people living on the front lines of, in, in, this, in this case, the safety net, the safety net system. So we kind of had to change courses very quickly. Um, but all of those moments and hours that I and my team spent sitting and listening in the waiting room had a profound impact on how we decided to tell our film. And we decided to tell our film in a way that took the politics out of it and simply allowed the stories of these people in this waiting room to come forward in, in a non-polemic non way. And, and so I'm going to show you a clip from, from the film, um, which I think is a, 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 one of the sections of the film where you go into the waiting room. And part of what we wanted to do is just give you a, a visceral sense of what it's like just dropping into that waiting room. Because it's a really amazing place where people of all different nationalities, classes, um, economic, the economic spectrum are all in this place together, shared by a common experience. People who would never ordinarily be in the same place. And we witnessed conversations between people that we, we felt were powerful and profound. And we wanted to try to capture that in some way. So why don't we roll the second clip? They called my name or not. I went downstairs to the cafeteria. That's why you got this food? Huh? That's why you got this food? Yeah, from the cafeteria. I heard got into a car accident a few months ago, and uh, the trauma team, like, they're, they, they're really good. I had a plate in my arm and in my leg. What? My car flew down the street. Uh, it was a head-on collision. Flew down the street. They're wrapped around a pole. Yeah. You truly blessed, girl. Yeah, I am. Thank God to them, though. They put me back together. <laughs> He's bailed out the brokerage companies. He's bailed out the realty companies. He, the, the, they should, the ones that should have gone bankrupt and, and gone out of business should have been allowed to do so. Small business. Hello. No, I went to school. Yeah, I'm at the doctor's. All right. A Hinde, a Jose, a host. That ain't nice. <laughs> you know, I do my best. A Hinde. When I was about seven years old, I got like 80 mosquito bites on my body, and I'd just eaten a lot of watermelon. Uh -huh. From that, I got really sick, you know. From that point on, I couldn't eat any more watermelon. It's good. I like cantaloupe. You know, I like papaya. Uh, okay. But watermelon? Uh, no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, that's a week. That's a week old. It was open heart surgery, 10 hour emergency surgery. That's God. God is good. Oh, amen. All the time. Amen. You get your hip surgery, man. Take care of yourself. I'm trying, I'm trying. Always. God bless you. Amen. Uh, so, so that was a clip from uh, from the waiting room, and you know the edit the editing process of this film was was incredibly uh, difficult because we shot so much material that that was great that that couldn't make it into the film, and we had moments where where you just sort of dropped in, into this waiting room. Um, I just looked at my clock. This 18 minutes is going by 
way quicker than I thought. And so I'm just going to wrap it up, and we're going to show a trailer from the film, which is showing tonight at 7.30 in the Geffen Auditorium, I, I believe. Um, but I, you know, I just want to conclude by saying that we are at this profound moment in time where we have an opportunity, partly due to the success of the film, to take what we've built um, with, this, with this storytelling project and this prototype and scale it out. And we, we have plans to travel around the country with partnering hospitals um, to tell more stories from hospitals around the country um, and partner with academics to study you know, the impact of storytelling in the clinical environment, bring designers into the process to come up with what is the best design to surface these stories in, in waiting rooms where people are stuck for often hours and where we believe we can take an isolating and disconnected experience and turn it, turn it into more connective, connected and active experience that we believe will have a profound impact on the patient experience. And so um, we look forward to connecting with many of you all as we move forward and making connections here as we unfold this project. I will leave you with the trailer for our film and hope to see you tonight. Thanks. You have to wait for the same day and emergency services. No appointment. already. Please talk soft, but keep talking. The emergency department is completely full. The beds in the department in the hospital are full, so nobody moves. So there, I can't let this guy slip through the cracks. You ask the media, well, ask Reno, call up there and ask them. I was just laid off my job in March, so all I have is unemployment. These bills, these money bills. Heart rate is really high. It never had anything happen to me. It was like my invincible 20s. It's okay. This is just a little focus. I won't okay. go until you're ready, okay, Deja? Three-year-old male, uh, gunshot wound in the lower left. Diagnosed with a stroke, was kicked out the door and sent here. We're a public hospital. We're the safety net in society. We're an institution of last resort for so many people. Come on, sit with me. You want to see the doctor today, huh? Yeah. You trying to take the pain? Oh, OK. It's going to be OK, though. So we're putting your DKA in seven. We're putting seven in three. We're putting three in the hallway. This is my first time being in the hospital. All right, well, congratulations. It's going to be first. Thank God to them, though. They put me back together. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Try it. Try it. Come on, sit with me. I knew it would happen. You knew it would happen? Yeah. You remember me, right? Bro, who can forget you?